all. This is Dr. Mobin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. And with me today, the rock star, Dr. Bill Murphy, is with us. Uh, Dr. Murphy, welcome. And for the newer uh, Cool Beans who do not know you, please tell us a little about yourself as well. Sure. Um, I have a, my doctorate in immunology. I've been doing uh, basically cancer and viral immunology for over 37 years now. Uh, I, after my doctorate, I was at the National Cancer Institute for 12 years. Uh, and now currently I'm at UC Davis in the departments of uh, internal medicine, HEMONC, and uh, dermatology, um, and my and vice chair of research. And what I work on is basically using the immune system to fight both cancer, but also how we fight viruses. And lately we've been looking at the impact of obesity on uh, anti-tumor responses. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. And with this, Today's topic is exciting. It is even an interesting, fascinating area for me as well to understand and learn more. So CAR T cells and cancers. So um, you have a presentation as well. I'll bring it up. But generally, what are CAR T cells? So yeah, part of my research is also uh, we're working now with uh, making a new kind of what we call CAR T cell. These are genetically engineered immune cells where we take them from the pate, take your immune cells, your T cells from a patient, and then we uh, actually alter them genetically so they now can be specific for a, a particular cancer antigen. Um, and this has actually been a game changer with regard to certain kinds of leukemias, lymphomas. They're FDA approved. There's over five different products, uh, companies that make these. Um, and they've resulted in cures in normally refractory, which means the patients have relapsed from all other therapies in leukemias and lymphomas, and they've resulted in long-term, greater than 10 years now, uh, disease-free uh, in both children and adults with certain leukemias and lymphomas, mainly B-cell uh, leukemia and lymphomas. So they're a game changer, and um, they're actually now being looked at not just for cancer, uh, but they're being looked at as a way to cure autoimmunity, antiviral. It's basically now making this cell more specific, and therefore also we apply it and we can now direct it to how we want to use it, whether it's to get rid of autoreactive cells or cancer cells. There's still a lot of uh, uh, hurdles in, all, in how we're going to be able to really use these, and one of these is cost, and the other is making them actually, more importantly, work for solid cancers which I'll go into a little bit, but this is probably, I would think that it's going to be a Nobel Prize in the next year or two because it's been so revolutionary and now applied regularly at a lot of cancer centers. Understood, thank you so much. So I have your presentation here. Please guide me that I can move mm -hmm. it forward, backwards, and let's look at it. So, so just looking at this, these are scanning EEM photos uh, the bigger cell that you're seeing on the top, that's a breast cancer cell. And the cell on the bottom is a uh, NK cell, natural killer cell. I work on those too. And so it's very nice to see that you can see, a lot of people were wondering whether the immune system really can see cancer. Uh, and this is showing that the NK cell is looking, finding the cancer cell. The next uh, uh, panels, you're seeing the NK cells binding to the cancer cell. And then you're seeing the NK cell in the third panel literally punching a hole in the cancer cell and that actually causes the cell to lice and then what you're seeing on the last part is the skeleton of the cell and the nk cell now looking for another cell to kill so we've known this for many years in the test tube it works under controlled situations the problem is because cancer is a, in a very complex environment and it's in a very rapid growth state and getting the immune cells at the right time it's how do we make this better or we can see what we see in vitro, can it work as far as clinically? And that's always been the issue that people have been working on. Understood. So, so this is basically uh, what I was talking uh, last week and the week before about the how cancer is normally treated is the three arms, which would be chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy. And chemotherapy is not just uh, the poisons per se, but also what we call targeting agents. Uh, that are specific for the cancer, but also hormone block and things like that. And this has been the, the basically the hallmark of how we would attack a cancer, regardless of any cancer, uh, to varying degrees. 
And then really it's the immune system, as I mentioned in the last talk, as far as the fourth arm, where it's finally working, where, and it's gonna be like with anything else, it's probably gonna be where we don't just rely on one arm. It's a combination of all the arms, just like with anything else. It's better attack at multiple angles to actually get a true eradication because you have to realize that the tumor is not just one cell, it's very heterogeneous, it's constantly changing and adapting. And so that makes it very tricky as opposed to a virus per se. Understood. And I've mentioned before, this is the immune theory as far as it's T cells and NK cells. So uh, everything that we've learned about viruses can be applied to cancer. So viruses basically infect a, a normal cell and basically make it now its own cell and it has to be killed just like a cancer cell is its own cell needs to be killed so uh, if you're an immunologist we know that antibodies as a rule we use those against bacterial infections and when we're dealing with viruses it's mainly t cells and nk cells these are cells that are everywhere in the body and are constantly being developed and used okay and this is what we've learned in cancer these are the cells that usually give us the best responses now antibodies can be used and work but the problem with antibodies is they're proteins and they're finite and they degrade and go away t cells and nk cells your immune system basically it's amazing it becomes like a robot like an energizer bunny it it'll keep going as long as there's a target there and that's what you want you don't want something that actually then just stops. You want it to because the cancer is going to try to hide. It's going to try to either become where it, it goes into areas that the immune cells don't see or it's going where it loses certain antigens or sometimes cancers can become dormant um, and you don't see them for a long period of time. You want those immune cells always around, just like if you have a latent virus like EBV or CMV, where if it sees it, it kills it. And that's what makes the T cells and NK cells so attractive for cancer therapy because remember the primary tumor is usually not the thing that actually causes you the most damage it's the metastasis and that's going to be where in distal sites and it's going to be something that unfortunately it's also rapidly growing and you want something that can keep up with it and that's why in viruses t cells and nk cells work so well because it will they rapidly grow to rid you of the virus and the idea is to apply it to cancer Understood. Thank you so much. Oh, and I just, that's where immunotherapy is now the fourth arm. So, got it. And you're seeing it in the lay press. When I call the lay press, that means the nine scientific literature. It's everybody is talking breakthroughs. All right. And so you're seeing now. When I was at the National Cancer Institute, immunotherapy was brutal. It was very, we didn't know how to use it. It was very toxic. So now we're seeing where we can apply immunotherapy and we're getting smarter on how we use it. And we're seeing now longer term effects and more manageable ways to use it, which is important. But it's important to keep in mind, it's not a one size fits all. People lump immunotherapy as like one type of treatment. It's many, many different types of treatments and you cannot just apply it to all to the same type of cancer or even the same type of individual. How a, you, a immunotherapy in an older person versus a younger person. But you're seeing this word used a lot. And basically, it's the thing where now you're seeing more and more oncologists using it. it used to be specialized oncologists would use it. Now you're seeing it now mainstream, which is very important. So I think that's why it makes it very attractive. But it's unfortunate because immunology is a very complex science. How do we see self from non-self, how it evolves? And with cancer, now you have another variable that's also trying to adapt against it. Understood. Okay, so the usually the hallmark when you know something's working is that you see FDA starting to approve uh, these kinds of therapies. The FDA is going to approve them if they're showing efficacy and it's showing longer-term effects and it's it, it basically working where maybe other things wouldn't. The uh, PD-1, PD-L-1, or what we call Checkpoint, uh, was a Nobel Prize I mentioned before several years ago. This has now been uh, applied in many cancers, solid cancers, liquid cancers, and it has uh, significant effects. It's not a cure-all. In other words, what we'll see is maybe 15, 20% of the population, depending on the cancer and the stage and the grade, 
will respond, some won't, because everybody's immune system is different, everybody's cancer is different, but you are seeing more and more applications of immunotherapy that are being approved, which means it works. Um, and this is not just the checkpoint, but you're seeing other types of immunotherapy as well. And that's what's making this very exciting because usually you know you're gonna have a problem when you don't have a lot of approved drugs at your disposal. Now you're seeing more in the arsenal, which is very encouraging. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay, and this is what I mentioned before. When you're talking immunotherapy, uh, next slide, there's different approaches. These are the classic approaches that uh, people have been thinking about. Uh, for the longest time, we've been trying to vaccinate against the tumor. The problem is, by the time you know you have the cancer, it's usually so big and your immune system's already been suppressed, it's not gonna work. Uh, the other arm on the, on the upper right was strong immune stimulants. This is where we would give a toll agonist, like I mentioned before, BCG or a high dose interleukin-2. Again, the problem with that is you're giving high stimulation. The idea is we want to jumpstart, but the problem with that is it's usually causing a lot of toxicities and it's not sustainable. The checkpoint block, as I mentioned before, that was a game changer. That's when we learned that we don't need to put our foot on the gas. We need to take our foot off the brake to get the immune system to work well. The problem with that is you take your foot off the brake, you can get autoimmunity. And that is where we talked about is a fine line between you know, cost benefit ratio. But it's definitely something that is working. Now, CAR therapy is a new type of therapy in which what we're doing is we're taking the T cells or the immune cells out, changing them, and then putting them back into the patient. This is an extension that actually that's been already shown to work. It's already been shown an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. That means if you take your uh, uh, bone marrow from another donor, related donor, put it into a leukemia patient, those donor T cells will attack the cancer and you get what we call a graft versus tumor effect and it can result in a cure. That was a Nobel Prize many years ago by E. Donald Thomas and others. So we know that the immune cells can work the problem was a bone marrow transplant is very toxic uh, and it can have a lot of uh, collateral damage. The CAR therapy has been looked at for many years and it was just a matter of how do we engineer it where it gets active enough. And that's where I think they finally made the breakthrough where they're figuring out how to make this, the T cells more active and more sustained. And that's where we're seeing it working and it's replacing uh, and now as a front line. It used to be the CAR therapy was only if you had relapse leukemia lymphoma. Now it's being looked at as a front line. The problem is it's very, very expensive. Um, and it's something that we have to start working on to make more accessible. Agreed. And just very quickly, uh, you and I are in a uniform today. We received the email to come with the same colored shirts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, you you got to put your tie on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I missed that part. Yeah. Okay, so how to t this is important because why do we have to engineer the T cells? Why can't we just, because what people have done in the past, like Steve Rosenberg at NCI and others, is if they take like in melanoma, they can take the tumor out and they see T cells in the tumor and they know they're specific. They try to grow them up, expand them and put them back in, but they don't seem to work well. And part of the problem is the T cells, just because our body is always worried about autoimmunity. Remember, we've never really been developed to fight cancer per se. It's more from the standpoint of virus. And, auto, and, and viruses are easy because they're foreign. They're completely foreign. And so they're a great target. Cancer's a lot trickier than that, right? It's a more chronic. And so the problem with T cells is that you have to see the antigen. That means what's different on the cancer cell versus normal cells because your immune system is tolerized. That means it sees yourself as safe and it has to see something different. And the cancers is the very subtle differences. And it has to be in the context. It's a very complicated concept as far as MHC called restriction. This is a very slow process and it can take, and then depending on the magnitude, uh, it takes time and it's not as robust as we would like in a cancer cell because again, most people when they're diagnosed may already have metastasis. And so you're dealing with a very high tumor burden that's outpacing your immune cells. So we had to make the T cells more efficient. Okay. Got it. And this is the concept of a CAR T cell. 
So what we're doing, instead of using the, letting the T cell use what it normally uses, which would be what the T cell receptor is, we actually use an antibody. And we make the antibody so the T cell now can see base like antibody recognition. And then we use uh, signaling motifs. That means we actually, once it binds, it activates the cell. And then it becomes, all these cells now become very specific and they activate very fast and they uh, kill and they expand. And it basically becomes this like robot that then just takes over and uh, keeps finding the target and kills the cancer cells. That's what a genetically engineered T cell is. Very interesting. So the, the word chimeric right. antigen receptor, what does chimeric mean? Chimeric means that if you look on that, what you're seeing that's a target binding domain, that is an antibody. So that's a certain type of protein. And then if the activation domain, that's different kind of molecules uh, uh, that are for the T cell receptor. So it's a chimera. That means a chimera means it's two different proteins kind of fused together. You get the best hmm. of both worlds. You get the antibody binding, but you're now getting the T cell activation. It's a new molecule that the body then can use. Interesting, thank you. So why do we use T cells? The beauty of T cells is that they're easy to generate and use, and they live a long time. They live for the long, as long as you do. Now that can be good or bad, uh, it's the hard part is once the cancer is going away, those T cells, you know, could be a problem. Uh, but most importantly, this is important, they clonally expand. What do I mean by that? That means once they see the target, they not only kill, but then they make more of themselves. That's mm -hmm. very important. So in other words, what you put in, you're going to get a lot more once it keeps going. All right. And that's what we call a living drug. It keeps going. And most importantly, and this is why it makes it very attractive, these T cells can actually traffic. When I say traffic, they can migrate and they get into the tissues and the places that antibodies don't get into easily and they seek out and find, just like they would for a virus. But that's how they can find the cancer. That makes them incredibly good. They're like watchdogs that can keep looking around and then once they find it, then they know they can keep going and activate and kill. The other thing that makes them kind of attractive is they have multiple ways to do this. They can kill directly, they make different kinds of immune factors, cytokines, and they can amplify the process. And so these make them great weapons if we can harness them and make them specific, more specific. Interesting. So what are the sources? So right now what's FDA approved is everything is what we call autologous. That means we take them from the patient. All right. Why? Because if we take them from another person or another source, that that cancer patient's immune system will still work and will reject those cells just like an organ rejection. So just like if you were going to get a kidney transplant, you have to be on immunosuppression. You don't want to be on immunosuppression if you have cancer. Right. And so the bottom line is they're trying to figure ways to uh, that's something we can talk about where we can make cells from allogeneic. That means different donors but we're gonna to have to figure ways that we can get them to sustain and graph and hide them from their patient's immune system. Uh, but mm -hmm. autologous is the way to go. We would actually, because we know there will be no immune rejection, we know they're safe, they won't attack the patient. Because the other thing people are a little bit worried about, like in a bone marrow transplant, if you get an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, there's something called graft versus host disease in which the donor T cells attack you uh, by, and, and the cancer, but that's a big problem autologous, you don't get that problem. But the next wave, this is what we really, the problem with autologous is uh, there's a lot of issues. Cancer patients' immune system and their T cells may not be that good. They've undergone maybe chemotherapy, things like that. They're older. Uh, it takes time. Um, and so the next wave that people are looking at is what we call off the shelf. That means um, you don't have to take, you can have cells already made and frozen and you just apply them to any cancer patient but you're going to have to figure ways that you don't get them rejected. That's where the future is going to be. So I think that this part of the future will be that there will be people who at their younger, healthier time will donate their own T cells hmm. to be frozen, to be used in the future when they are older. That, you know, that's an interesting concept. I mean, people have done that with their, like uh, people have saved uh, their core blood for their kids for future bone marrow transplants. I've known professors that work with radiation 
that say some bone marrow just in case. Um, yeah. It's possible. Uh, I think it's going to be more likely, though, by the time we get to that stage, they're probably going to optimize ways to do third party. Uh, because, again, we may not need those T cells to be around all the time. Depending hmm. on the type of cancer, if you have an acute cancer, acute lymphoma, acute leukemia, or highly aggressive, you want an immediate effect fast, right? If hmm. you have a more slower growing cancer that's harder, then maybe you want those T cells around longer. So it may be that uh, we may not have to have them around all the time. Okay, that's really that's debatable. True. Just a quick question before we move on. Cynthia says, what is the current comparative pricing? Yeah, I'm going to go into that in a little bit, but it's about uh, $500,000 for a CAR T-cell application. But that's not including that patients usually undergo inpatient hospital. They have to get a lot of, uh, it can be about $1 million. Um, they're FDA approved. FDA, will, uh, so insurance will cover maybe 300000 uh, right now, our hospital at UC Davis, we lose about $200,000 per patient because of what insurance won't cover. Um, and then it's going to be a matter of then how is that covered? Um, and so that has been the big issue. So and I'm going to go into how we can circumvent that and how we're doing that. Uh, what we're seeing is rather than send the cells for a company to make, we're going to see if we can make the cars what we call in-house we call a, a site on the site per se, and that saves a lot. Uh, and we'll go into that in a little bit, but that's, it's very expensive, about 1 million, 1.5 million. And a lot of that will depend on if the patient develops complications because there's what we call cytokine release syndrome and things like that associated with car therapy. It, again, you're using something that's like a bull in the China shop. And um, some of the initial patients that received car therapy literally went into comas because there was so much tumor being killed all at once. It's called tumor lysis syndrome. They were getting uh, toxins overload and a cytokine overload. Uh, and now we're trying to figure ways to uh, make that a little bit more uh, uh, better. I guess we'll have to make more macrophages that do not release a lot of cytokines, but then go and just pick up that trash. Yeah, or well, and actually people, that is actually being looked at. They're looking at depleting macrophages to get rid of the, some of this. So that is being looked at. Again, you're dealing with a lot of then things you're piling on. But yes, that is being looked at. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, so this one is just why. So everybody often asks, well, we're always seeing the cars being used for leukemias and lymphomas. As I mentioned in my previous uh, discussions on cancers, one of the things with an antibody is it binds directly. It can see an antigen. But the problem is it has to be on something that is either can you can live without because you're going to kill the normal as well as the tumor, or it's got to be something that's specific for the tumor. And that's been very difficult. Okay. With lymphomas and leukemias, because of certain antigens they express, we call them CD19, 20, 22, um, these are on all B cells but they're also on the leukemia and lymphoma. And so in the past, people have looked at antibodies uh, to these uh, uh, antigens, and they've even conjugated them with toxins and radiation. Um, the problem is it's still difficult to get rid of all the tumor. And so the advantage of the CAR T cells is when we make them specific using antibodies to these molecules, you will not have any B cells. In fact, they just came out with a study where they looked 10 years later, the patient's cured, but they have no B cells, <laughs> all right? And they have to be on, uh, but you can get intravenous antibody uh, infusions, and that'll keep you fine. Uh, the important thing is you're not succumbing to the leukemia lymphoma. That's what makes this so difficult to apply to other kinds of cancers. With B cells, because they constantly turn over throughout life, okay, that means that they, even if you don't have them, you can do okay. And also, uh, even if you do, uh, uh, get rid of the lymphoma, you can make more eventually if the cars go away. So some people are what we call suicide vectors. We're trying to figure ways to turn off the car once the tumor's gone away. So we can then kill the car once the tumor's gone and your normal B cells come back. That's gonna be another way in the future. But the thing is with solid cancers, it's been very difficult. When I call it solid cancers, we're talking breast cancer, colon cancer, the, the common cancers, we don't have antibodies 
that are that specific. In fact, I don't know if I'm going to talk about it. But, uh, well, let's go into the next slide. Maybe I talk about the toxicity issue. Uh, no, this is this. So this is just telling you the it's the genetic engineering here has been a marvel, and it's changing so fast. Uh, the car field is it's almost it's very difficult even for the FDA to keep up because it's almost like every week they're coming up with something better that works better. And then you have to test it all over again because it's a new product. Uh, but they're, people are trying to make them faster and better, as with everything. Uh, next slide. And so this is the concept of why it's chimeric. You take this is a, what an antibody looks like. The antibody can bind directly. We're just taking that circular part, the small antigen binding domain, okay? And then we're going to make it a chimera with the signaling that you just saw. Next slide. All right. So this is just the antibody. I'm uh, sorry. Keep going again. I, I, this is actually for a scientific. And then we're actually making a new molecule. This is the chimeric antigen receptor. Um, and so this is going to have all the properties of binding, but also the signaling. The first cars didn't work. The first cars, we were using what we call uh, the regular T cell signaling. And what we find we, we have to soup them up a little bit uh, by actually playing with other kinds of signaling motifs. And that's why the initial cars, the concept was there, but they didn't result in real cures. Next slide. So just a quick comment here. I am so fascinated by the idea because as the antigen bind here, yep. there is conformational change that reflects throughout this to activate this area. Exactly. So how are they able to transplant these two molecules and still have them do conformational changes that are compatible with each other? It blows my mind. So these molecules are fused together. Okay, that's what you're seeing right there. No, keep going, go to the yeah. next slide. Uh, right there, the first generation car. You have the antibody that's on the right there, the, which is the pink or mauve or whatever the heck that is. And then it's actually, it's a, what we do is we're actually putting a gene sequence in that is actually a hybrid gene of part of it's the antibody gene sequence, part of it's yeah. the T-cell signaling gene sequence. And then we're using a retrovirus or a lentivirus to actually infect these T cells. And these viruses are what we call replication defective. That means they won't uh, uh, give rise to new virus, but once they integrate, it's in the genome of those cells and it's permanent. So we're hmm. making a basically a totally new gene that gets hmm. now incorporated in the T cell. The T cell then makes this and puts it on the surface like it's a regular its own protein and it works. So th this is an area where I can just keep digging and I think I'll, I'll waste a lot of people's time. But I just ask one more question. Yep. Isn't that when the new genome is integrated, our cells have internal defense mechanisms to kind of excise it or destroy it or just do apoptosis? How do you tell the cell that, hey, don't mind this new gene that I'm putting in? Well, this is why uh, we've learned from viruses. So we learn how if you talk to Carl June, he said, I learned from HIV. So HIV is a retrovirus. What it does is it incorporates into the T cell. That's how we learn. And it actually takes over that T cell, right? And so mm -hmm. there are defense mechanisms, but retroviruses and lentiviruses are very subtle. Other viruses, you're right, are more uh, elicit some of these uh, defense pathways. But these kinds of retroviruses are evolved literally to infect T cells like in HIV. And they've been able to do it in this kind of a situation where you don't get that kind of a response. Interesting. The part, Thank you very though, much. One thing that is now, it's been in the, it was just in the New York Times uh, about a week ago. What you're always worried about with any kind of gene therapy, this is gene therapy, with any kind of gene therapy, there, what people worry about is you better hope it integrates in the right area of the chromosomes. You worry about what we call insertional mutagenesis. And which means in some of the early gene therapies, people would develop cancers because these genes were uh, going into wrong spots and going by oncogenes and they were transforming. There was just an article in the New York Times saying the FDA has reported 19 cases of patients developing what we call secondary cancers from CAR therapy. Now, there have been thousands of CAR therapy patients that haven't shown anything and it's still not shown it's, it hasn't been definitively shown whether this is due to the car becoming a tumor 
but it's just something that keep in mind it's a very delicate process you're you know whenever you put something into the genes into the genome you better hope it's going right and it's reasonably controlled for the most part they've been extremely safe interesting thank you so much this is fascinating so this is where we're at now the first generation didn't work we're now and I say second, we're actually more of third and fourth generation. But what we're doing is we're now playing with that box there, those signaling motifs, and we're finding that this causes now the cars to activate better and kill better and have more sustained effects. This is the ones that have been working and are now FDA approved. The first generation did not. They didn't give up. They've optimized it, made it better, and now they're seeing that these actually work. Interesting. Okay, so this is the process. Now, this is the process on how you make a car. Hmm. Now, you have to get the blood from a patient. This is usually a leukophoresis. So you, you need a fair amount of uh, lymphocytes, T cells. Now, in the lab, you can make them all in one stop. But normally hmm. what's made is you have the patient and we take the blood and we ship it to a company that then makes the car, what they do is they take the T cells, they purify them, they activate them, they trans, we call it transduce them, they expose them to the virus, the, vi the T cells now expand. Now we have to grow them up. They have, you have to give a lot of cells because you're trying to get them everywhere for the cancer patient. And it usually takes about a week to 10 days, grow them up, then they freeze them down. And then the patient, actually, they don't just get the CAR T cells, the patient now has to get chemotherapy to make space for the CAR T cells. They get high dose chemotherapy, which can be very intensive, and then they get the CAR T cells, and then the cars actually then expand and kill. What we're trying to do now is do exactly what you're seeing here. We're trying to make them in house. That means certain mm -hmm. medical centers and cancer centers have what we call GMP. Uh, facilities that are capable of making cell therapies and we're making them and we've done it here and that will save a tremendous amount of money about save about $150,000 so that's what wow. the next wave is very interesting okay so this is the, this is really what tells the story that complete response means that you're seeing patients where literally the tumor goes away and this is B cell lymphoma, B cell leukemias. And you can see, and this is you, and then the initial patients, this is refractory. That means nothing else works. Usually you get the frontline therapy, chemo, maybe some molecular targeting agents, maybe some antibody therapy. It's failed. The cancer's now uh, basically become resistant. And now you get the CARs, and you're seeing now literally the tumors melting in some of these patients. And you're talking long term cure. This is some of the earlier studies. But safety look at the bottom you're seeing cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity uh, and can be severe all right so this is not a walk in the park the patients are getting high dose chemo uh that's uh, making them very and they usually these are at relapse or advanced cancer patients and then they're getting the car therapy the car is doing its work it's killing the tumor cells causing a lot of toxicities these are things that all have to be managed in the hospital And this is just showing the scans before and after treatment. Uh, and like I said, it, it's amazing. You actually can see the lymphoma. This is a lymphoma literally melting from the car therapy. All right. And you're seeing long-term cures. So for the B cell lymphoma leukemias, this has been uh, it's a home run in the sense of you're seeing tremendous responses. We're not at 100%. And you're seeing that, unfortunately, the, sometimes a tumor comes back, and how do tumors basically come back? They adapt and they evade. So in the tumors that come back, sometimes they lose that antigen. So the car has nothing to see anymore. And so that's what we're working on as far as in our therapy, is making a car that can see three things at once. Mm -hmm. So that even if one is downregulated, others are there. Exactly. And it's good, just like with HIV. With HIV... AZT by itself didn't work. DDI didn't work. You had to do a combination of the uh, antiretrovirals so that the virus could never adapt uh, sufficiently in time. 
And same thing with cancer. Most likely, if you're just targeting one platform, it's going to mean the cancer will have a high chance of either downregulating or losing the antigen. What we want to do is now choose several such that the cancer never has a chance at any one time to lose all three. Understood. So a question Michelle Pearson says, Parson says, why are some cancers receptive to immunotherapy and some not? My husband has myxoid liposarcoma, and we were told this cancer is not receptive to immunotherapy. Right. And this is, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, immunotherapy is like an umbrella term, right? So uh, with CARS, it's only working in leukemia and lymphomas right now. They're looking at it in glioma and some others. Immunotherapy, when people talk about immunotherapy, they're usually talking about like checkpoint block and other kinds of immunotherapy. And that's usually contingent on the type of cancer. Some cancers don't have a lot of what we call mutations that cause antigens. We call the mutational burden, mutational load. That's one reason. Um, other cancers are where they're located or how they spread. The immune cells just don't get in there enough to outpace the cancer. So the immunotherapy, when you're dealing with like sarcomas, for example, you're dealing with some uh, these solid cancers. That's been the big issue with a lot of cancers. It's, it depends on the type of cancer. With some sarcomas, the way they spread and also the antigens or lack thereof that the immune system can see and use is more limited. And we haven't been able to figure out better ways to attack them. Uh, and that's gonna take some time. Understood, thank you very much. So yeah, this is the cost. So somebody was asking about the cost. If you can just look at the different costs of the different car therapies in the bottom right, that's just for one infusion. All right, hmm. that means they make them. That's just to get the product. All right, hmm. but you then have to deal with all the things that go up to that point where the patient's getting uh, chemotherapy and going through the process. Because if they, a lot of the car therapies are toxic. So they have to give certain, like they give, just like with COVID, they give anti-IL-6 or IL-6 block, uh, tozolizumab and others to control the cytokine storm. These are also very expensive. And so car therapy is still very expensive and it also takes time, all right? And so it's the kind of thing, time is the one thing a leukemia and can, uh, lymphoma patients sometimes don't have. And so if we can make things in-house at the site, we can decrease the time and decrease the cost. That's where I think a lot of places are starting to look at. Uh, almost like what you're seeing is people trying to think of the idea of making mobile units that can go even to other centers. Or hot. You don't have to be at a comprehensive cancer center, for example, uh, where you can maybe transport this so it's more readily available. Interesting. I used to tell Cool Beans in our discussions that there will be in the future designer therapy centers present in every city to say here is where you can go and your cell therapies will be designed for you yep. it almost seems like that <clears throat> I, I think that will be the case all right so what are the limitations well again not it's not a cure-all and even with the lymphoma leukemia you saw there's a response rate but it's still 40 percent are going to relapse and part of the big issue is the tumor loses the antigen right? And because tumors mutate and it's going to lose the antigen. And guess what? Once it loses it, there's nothing for the car to see. The cars actually then go away. They need to see the engine to keep going. And then you get a rapid relapse. Uh, the other problem is cars can be toxic. They attack normal cells. In fact, uh, well, maybe I'll talk about the car associated toxicities. But um, and then the other issue is with solids in particular, the tumor, if you may recall, is very immunosuppressive. It's trying to suppress it. You know? And so even if the cars get in, sometimes they don't work well because the tumor is suppressing by different factors and that has to be looked at. Interesting. A quick question. Mm -hmm. For us is, how did this new T-cell therapy work? Conventional T-cells scan the surface of other cells to find anomalies and, are elim and eliminate cancer cells which express abnormal proteins. So in this case, there are specific antigens on top of the cell surface, which CAR are then trained to go and attack, correct? Right, and this, the antibody sees an antigen directly, and that's, a diff, that's very different than a regular T cell. And, that, and actually, that's a really good question because another way of people are looking at it is they're actually now actually thinking, well, maybe CARs won't work for solid cancers 
we need to actually know what T cell receptors are specific and then make them better and transduce those onto the T cells. And that's a whole nother area that's coming into play now, which under a lot of, and it, it may be a better way to approach solid cancers, mainly because antibodies and solid cancers are more limited on, they're going to cross react. Understood. Next slide. Okay, so no, I didn't talk about that. Okay, so how did we, there was a hard lesson that was learned. Herceptin is used in breast cancer, okay? And that's an antibody to HER2 uh, uh, that's overexpressed on breast cancer cells. And Herceptin's used and it works. It has anti-tumor effects. And so they said, well, let's use that as a car, all right? And so they made the Herceptin antibody and they put it in a car and one of the patients died within hours because an antibody is different because it's more contained. Once the T cells see something, they keep going. And unfortunately, uh, the HER2 new antigen is not tumor specific. It's also on some lung cells and can be, and the person had uh, lung mets. Um, and so the cause just went out of control. And so you have to be very careful when you're dealing with solid cancers, because a lot of times the antibodies that we see cross react with the normal tissue and epithelial cells. And when you're dealing with liver, lung, brain, that's not an acceptable mm -hmm. collateral damage. Okay. So the maybe, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, so maybe in the future, antibody selection will mean we select an antibody, then we create a radio labeled antibody of the same kind and send it in the body first to see how far the targeting is and then yeah. decide if that is that's still no. very difficult because again the antibody will not have the same effects as the t cell and remember remember i said the t cells can actually migrate and they get into Correct. the tissues and so the antibody so you may you'll miss that that's what they miss with their receptors no my my point is we inject the antibody that are labeled yeah. just to be able to see the map of the body that how far that antigen is present and what our car going to attack if yeah. it is in the lungs and livers and yeah i i think that what people are realizing is it still it may not still be sufficient we either have to find something that is truly tumor specific uh mm -hmm. and make an antibody and people are looking at that or we're going to have to use that whole nother area that i was talking about tcr transduce that's where there's a lot of companies a lot of academic centers looking at that because that's safer and that and, and that may be what you're going to see and make them better um so this is the thing where i was telling you about the antigen gets lost you see the car attacking that b cell lymphoma the it's a cd19 car those are fda approved the tumor then loses the cd19 doesn't need it it's going to lose it and then the tumor comes back and now you got a problem because now the patients relapse and they've also had high dose chemo and their immune system's crapped out too. So it's a real issue. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, okay, I didn't want to go into this, but we're working on, so what we made is uh, this. So there's what we call a duo car, it's tri-specific. Now we're making the car so it sees three things at once. The three different antigens on that lymphoma, such that no matter what, it will be triggered and all you need is one for it to kill. With the idea that it's simple arithmetic, that it's gonna be a matter of how much time does the tumor have to adjust? And if you take away options, then you're gonna get greater eradication. So that's what right now is being done in our laboratory. We're doing the FDA studies right now to put it into patients next year. Very interesting. I love this idea of attacking three, so tumor doesn't have sufficient time to adjust them all down. Yep. Uh, and you don't have to go. This is how we do our studies. It's it's more of the, the same thing here. This is just data, uh, the, uh, and how we test it in vivo. Again, a mouse isn't human. So how do you test these things? It's really hard. So you can't just look in. A, I showed you in the test tube. Everything works in the test tube. But how do you gonna know if it's gonna work in a, in a, so we would use these special mice that have no immune system and we put human tumors in and then we put the human product in. It's not great, but at least it gives an idea 
because then we can look for toxicity and specificity, longevity, and things like that. That's the model that we use. Understood. Uh, that's okay. There's more data where the cars cure, and this is just showing that we see the tumors go away and the T cells there. Okay, and this is just where we're going. So where we're going now is it works. Now we're trying to figure ways to make it better. And then also the other thing is we don't have to just use T cells. You're seeing a lot of people looking at what if we make car NK cells, car T regs, things like that. And we're trying to figure ways to keep the response going uh, so we get a sustained response. Okay. Understood. Okay. And this is important. You're going to see this. Car, it's not just for cancer. So this is, this is a game changer because normally if you have autoimmunity, you want to remove those autoreactive B cells or T cells, whether it's MS or RA or whatever. And that's hard. Um, and so the idea is we can use these cars to get rid of the autoreactive B cells. In fact, there are clinical trials looking at this as we speak. Uh, and that will be more efficient and eradicate an autoimmunity. You could also look at it in transplantation. Rather than being on systemic immunosuppression for the rest of your life, you give an immunosuppressive cell like a Treg, and you make it specific, a CAR Treg, and now you can actually be using that to induce permanent tolerance. And then finally, for viruses, people are looking at it where you can for COVID-2 and others. Can you use it to eradicate? In fact, there's actually a trial for HIV where we're looking at CARs to eradicate lately infected HIV infected cells. That's going on right now at UC Davis. And also looking at T cell regeneration repair. Um, uh, it's actually, it's funny because people are looking at it to see if they can get rid of senescent cells by using uh, antibodies to senescent uh, proteins. And that's been shown to work preclinically. That would be so interesting. If somebody has their own, their younger cells and then we can kill the senescent cells and put the younger cells in. Well, you, have right. a you don't even have to get the, uh, the idea is with senescence, you just get rid of the senescent cells and they're looking at even in Alzheimer's and other disease states, senescent cells accumulate as we age. You don't have to get necessarily have new cells. You just got to get rid of the old senescent cells that cause a lot of inflammation and a lot of damage. Hmm. So the other one that are not as badly damaged yet, they would just proliferate yeah. and cover the space. Definitely. Very interesting. And so, as I mentioned before, it's not just T cells. You're seeing cars being applied to many different cell types in many different kinds of conditions. And that's what makes it kind of tricky because the applications are outpacing the science. So people are applying what they know is a signaling for T cells, but let's just put it on any immune cell. So there's going to be a lot of mistakes along the way and a lot of suboptimal use, but you're going to see a lot of hype uh, in both with companies and others saying, oh, this is the next best thing, invest in it now. But I think that the science is not there yet. Understood. So th that was the conclusion. Some things, you know, it's the kind of thing, gene therapy, there was a bubble in gene therapy, what, about 20 years ago? And then there were some accidents, and then it sort of went on the wayside. And then uh, you start to see, as we understand more and more about the biology of the T cells and the biology of doing gene therapy, now it's here to stay. This is the kind of thing where uh, some therapies, they come and they go in as much as they're not really working as well as we'd hope, and they're too expensive. Uh, Provenge with dendritic cells is a classic example. Uh, but with the cars, you're definitely seeing enough long-term cures. Now they're trying to say, can we work on it in solid cancers? So there's uh, Stanford's doing some interesting work with gliomas and glioblastomas where they're seeing really uh, market effects of some cars. So, but again, as the person was asking about the types of cancer, every cancer is different type and it may, may not be amenable to car therapy. Uh, glioblastoma with some brain cancers are kind of attractive because they're, we know where they are and we just got to get the cells in there to kill. Um, and so, and it's going to be, oh, it's a good question. Is car being used to treat melanoma? Not as much, mainly from the standpoint, there's a lot of drugs that are used for melanoma that work. That's the other thing to think about when you're thinking about the cancers that you target and how to apply them because of the uh, toxicity of cars and the expense, you're usually using them in situations where nothing else is working um, uh, and certain types of cancers like that. 
uh, melanoma has got a lot of different kinds of uh, drugs and treatments that actually been very uh, 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 working very well, including checkpoint. So you're not seeing it as applied as much. What we would like to see is certain cancers where really nothing works, like pancreatic cancer, um, and obviously uh, you know you know late stage breast cancer, things like that. Uh, can it be applied? But again, we have to understand more about the tumors and then how to use the cars. Understood. Just one more question. I know it is 50 minutes. For us is what about food allergies? As far as to treat food allergies, that would be a, a $1.5 million expensive kind of cure. <laughs> I'm not sure. And then you'd have to go through high dose chemo. Mm. Again, it's almost like going through a mini bone marrow transplant. It's, it, it, it's very, very uh, mm. difficult procedure. Um, and it's usually that's why you use the most extreme cases. Uh, where there's really very little options. Understood. Husky says, what about the failed immunotherapy patient with hepatocellular cancer? Again, it's going to be more on uh, what's the immunotherapy. So uh, with the CARs, it, again, because of the problems that they saw with the breast cancer patient with Herceptin, um, there's a lot of uh, caution on when you're dealing with vital organs like the liver, like the lungs, um, it's going to be more cautiously applied because your margin of error uh, for, to for fatal toxicities is just too great uh, and to control that. And it's gonna be very difficult until we can find better markers um, uh, better that we can use the car for um, I, uh, that are more specific. And that's been the big problem in solids. Uh, it's just not there yet. Understood. So, Dr. Murphy, such a beautiful talk and very promising future that you share with us. I wish that nobody needs to have these therapies and everybody is safe, but it seems like cancer therapies and more are just becoming better and better. And thank you very much for your work and your research and then sharing it with us. It's my pleasure. I really I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So with this, bye for now.